Today, we are pleased to welcome Professor Anna Marhold. Dr. Anna Marhold is an assistant professor at the Institute of Public Law and the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Her specializations are international and European energy law and regulation, international economic law, and international trade law. She holds a PhD in law from the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Her thesis explored the challenges of changing energy markets in international trade law. This is her third year teaching in the VLS summer session program where she teaches the course Global Energy Law and Policy. And today she'll present the talk, What's the Actual Deal with the EU Green Deal? Please join me in welcoming Professor Anna Marhold. Thank you very much, Jenny. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Marhold. I'm an assistant professor at uh, the Grotius Center for International Legal Studies at um, Leiden Law School in the Netherlands. And I want to thank you again for inviting me back to Vermont Law School. Um, to teach my course on um, global energy law and policy. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you again, um, albeit digitally this time. And I especially want to thank um, Jenny Rushlow, um, Kevin Jones and Courtney Collins for really being so welcoming. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I really want to thank you for this opportunity. So what I want to talk to you today um, about during this Hot Topics lecture is the European Green Deal. Um, you, this might have been something you've been hearing about um, recently. Um, you hear it quite a lot in the news. Um, it's a strategy that the EU has um, published and is quite serious about. But what is the actual deal with the EU Green Deal? So that is what we will discuss today. Um, and my presentation will be structured as follows. So first of all, I want to talk about the main features of the EU Green Deal. So what is the EU Green Deal in effect? What does it want to achieve? Then I want to focus on some of the key pieces of legislation that come with the EU Green Deal. And then zoom in on one of the more controversial aspects of the EU Green Deal, namely the carbon border adjustment mechanism that is now only um, a leaked document um, that isn't official yet. Then I want to touch upon some issues of compatibility with WTO law. This is also very relevant, um, especially uh, today. And also uh, to discuss some of the potential consequences for the US in this respect. Will the EU Green Deal affect um, US um, trade policy, for instance? So these are all the things that we want to discuss and touch upon today. After the presentation, I really look forward to um, receiving your questions and comments, and I hope we can have a fruitful debate. Well, let's get started. So the EU Green Deal is a very um, short document, in fact. It's only a 24-page strategy document, which is not a law. And it was published by the European Commission at the end of 2019, uh, before uh, the COVID pandemic outbreak. Um, basically, it is a very ambitious plan uh, to decarbonize Europe, and it covers every aspect of society and the economy. Um, through the EU Green Deal, the EU really aspires to be a global leader in the green energy transition. Um, but also, it doesn't want to be left behind um, in a green technology shift. For instance, we've seen that China has been um, absorbing most of solar power production. Um, and the EU just sees an opportunity here and really wants to become um, a leader in this respect and wants to be um, you know, innovative when it comes to green technology as well. 
So some of the objectives of the EU Green Deal are really to transform the EU into a modern, resource-efficient and competitive economy. And the ambitious goal is to be uh, climate neutral as the EU by 2050. But as an intermediate goal, the idea is to have 55 uh, less emissions by 2013 compared to the levels in 1990. The underlying idea is also to really decouple economic growth from resource use and to act in a kind of inclusive and holistic manner in the sense that um, the idea is to have no person and no place left behind. Of course, there's a price associated with this, and the estimated costs of the EU Green Deal are 82 to 147 billion euro a year. On the other hand, the EU also sees this as an investment, because if you think, for instance, of uh, rising ocean levels, um, the EU would have to invest an extreme amounts of money to prevent and mitigate that. And in this sense, this is seen rather as an investment than as a huge expense. The EU Green Deal really expands into various um, areas and various policy areas, and they are highlighted here. So again, you see here the goal of the EU to act as a global leader, and also the fact that nobody should be left behind. Now, you might say that this sounds maybe very idealistic, um, but on a policy level, it seems that um, um, the von der Leyen um, and Timmermans have realized that um, the EU can really use um, green growth um, as a tool um, and make it the heart of EU policy and also to use it to its competitive advantage. So apart from increasing the EU's climate ambition in 2030 and 2050, it's also very much about supplying clean, affordable and secure energy, mobilizing the industry for a clean and circular economy. It's also very much about building um, and renovating in an energy efficient way. You can imagine that a lot of the buildings that we have in Europe, especially the old ones, are not particularly energy efficient. Um, then it's also very important that there is a zero pollution ambition um, for a toxic free environment. Apart from that, it also extends the EU Green Deal to preserving and restoring ecosystems and biodiversity. With regard to agricultural policy, it is also about having a fair and healthy and environmentally friendly food system and also about accelerating the shift to sustainable and smart mobility. So as you can see, it's really an extensive plan um, that really covers all sectors of the economy um, that is ambitious in um, various dimensions with regard to agricultural policy, energy generation and supply, and energy efficiency, and um, ecosystems and biodiversity. It doesn't say that it's all easy and very straightforward um, to transform the current systems that we have in Europe. And one very obvious criticism uh, is that um, it is very hard to um, transform common agricultural policy. European ag common agricultural policy is currently the most costly EU policy in that um, it's a very heavily subsidized um, uh, sector. And the agricultural sector in the EU is currently responsible for 10% of EU greenhouse gas emissions. So in the provisional agreement reforming common, uh, common agricultural policy, there are some new elements that are focused towards um, improving the environment. So for instance, 55% of European funds must go into eco-schemes, and 35% of rural development funds must go into projects that promote environmental, climate, and animal welfare practices. What is also new in the reforms of the common agricultural policy is social conditionality. So that means that those farmers and sectors that benefit 
from uh, subsidies have to comply with social and labor regulations. There is a lot of criticism of um, this provisional agreement reforming EU common agricultural policy, and it especially comes from environmental NGOs. For instance, the agreement doesn't include reform that really obliges member states to put into place new practices to decrease greenhouse gas emissions, which favors polluting farmer practices. So the fact that there wasn't um, any um, greenhouse gas emissions reductions talks included in um, this agreement is seen um, as really a downside. And a lot of um, green and environmental activists simply state that these reforms are greenwashing. Although some advocates of these reforms, on the other hand, say that this is still progress, the fact that environment is really now included as a topic and also as a condition in the common agricultural policy. So one of the very new features is that there is now, uh, as of yesterday, the 28th of June, um, an EU-wide climate law. So this is basically one of, one of the pieces of key legislation of the EU Green Deal. There wasn't an EU-wide climate law before. And this is the first time that um, the goals of the EU Green Deal are really legally enshrined um, in EU law and have to be followed up by EU member states. So let's turn to some of these key parts of EU legislation with regard to the EU Green Deal. The EU-wide climate law really enshrines these targets, so the carbon uh, neutral target by 2050 and the 55 uh, emission cuts uh, as compared to 1990 by 2030 into law. And it targets overall EU emissions. So there's an EU-wide target rather than binding requirements for each country. So each country has to see what it can do and what it can realistically do. Um, but there is rather than, than trying to bind every EU member state separately, there is a target for overall EU emissions. Aside from that, the EU-wide climate law also um, establishes an independent climate expert body to monitor the progress with regard to decarb decarbonizing the European Union um, by 2050. So apart from this EU-wide climate law that is the key piece of legislation with regard to EU, the EU Green Deal, there is a myriad of regulations, plans and changes to EU law. One of those we briefly uh, discussed with regard to agriculture, but there are a lot of strategies with regard to hydrogen, building renovation, offshore wind energy. There's, for instance, a big plan um, to have a huge offshore wind park in the North Sea. Methane pollution, sustainable investment, and a circular economy. But um, maybe most famous, at the moment, or the most discussed, is the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, the CBAM proposal. This is currently a draft that was leaked by the Commission in June, and the final version is to be made public in July. Overall, it will be up to the separate member states to execute what um, the laws of um, EU Green Deal legislation prescribe. I want to focus on one of the most uh, controversial proposals as part of the EU Green Deal, and that is uh, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, uh, because this right away affects um, industries that want to import goods into the European Union. So the whole idea by, uh, of the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism is to impose carbon emission costs on the imports of goods, including steel, cement, and electricity. And it mainly uh, applies to 
um, these types of products. So steel, iron, cement, fertilizers, aluminum, and electricity would be the main targets. Um, these are considered often very energy intensive and polluting products. So it extends the European emission trading system to basically to non-EU industries of this kind. And it's a highly controversial part of the EU Green Deal, first of all because there are direct consequences for countries whose industries import these products into the EU, and because it can also run afoul of the rules of the World Trade Organization, which I will talk about a bit later. Um, the whole idea is to phase this carbon border adjustment mechanism in from 2023 and then have it fully implemented by 2026. So the proposal that was leaked spells out a method for, calculated, for calculating embedded emissions in imported products. And it covers both direct emissions, so those that are involved in the production. So what is that? That means where the producer has direct control over um, the process but also indirect emissions, such as electricity consumed during the production and process, uh, production process of goods. So it's both the production process itself, but also the input of energy that is used for um, producing these products. So according to the leak document, the carbon border tariff will not apply to countries um, within the customs union, so that includes Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway and Switzerland, nor will it apply to EU overseas territories. And if countries have a similar carbon pricing mechanism to Europe, the tariff would also not apply. But countries that have a high climate ambition but don't necessarily have such a similar carbon pricing mechanism, like the US and the UK, are not automatically exempt. On the other hand, the EU does consider to exempt the poorest countries um, with regard to applying this mechanism. Now, the CBAM would integrate um, into the European, the existing European emissions trading system, and it wor would work in a similar way. So specifically, only authorized declarants would be allowed to import the covered goods. So they would need to get um, an authorization prior to be able to import these products into the European Union. So these declarants would be authorized by so-called CBAM authority, um, when they meet the criteria um, and provide a bank guarantee. So the amount of the guarantee would need to cover the amount of the price of CBAM certificates that the authorized declarant surrenders each year to account for the emissions embedded, embedded in the imports of goods for the current and forthcoming year, um, as estimated by the CBAM authority. And each year, these authorized declarants would be obliged to submit annual declarations showing the emissions embedded in important goods during the previous calendar year and the number of surrendered CBAM certificates. So in this sense, there will be quite a lot of hurdles for those industries that would like to import these particular products into the European Union. Moreover, the emissions embedded in, in the important goods as shown by the number of surrendered CBAM certificates would also need to be verified by an independent verifier. And the authorized declarant may claim a reduction in the number of CBAM certificates to be surrendered corresponding to the carbon price paid in the country of origin for the declared emissions. There is also a special provision for aircraft operators in third countries, so there is a possibility for them to get registered in the EU with the confirmed amounts uh, of the embedded emissions in goods produced in those installations. And CBAM certificates could also be repurchased and sold 
by the CBAM authority to authorize declarants um, at the price calculated as the average of the closing price of all auctions of EU ETS allowances. And an interesting element is that there is no term of validity of an authorization in a Commission proposal. And in general, um, it should be mentioned that the proposal as such still remains quite broad and not very detailed with respect to how some of these mechanisms exactly are to work. So just a quick reminder for those who don't quite know how the European Union Emission Trading System works. That works on the basis of a cap-and-trade principle. So the whole idea is to uh, cover um, industries um, in the power sector and the manufacturing industry, as well as airlines operating within the EU and um, the customs union, so Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway as well. So a cap is set on the total amount of certain greenhouse gases that can be emitted from uh, by the in installations covered by the system. And the cap is reduced over time so that total emissions fall. And within the cap, installations buy or receive emissions allowances, which they can then trade with, another, with one another as needed. The limit on the total number of allowances available ensures that they have a value. So after each year, an installation must surrender enough allowances to fully cover its emissions. Otherwise, heavy fines are imposed. And if an installation reduces its emission, it can keep the spare allowances to cover its future needs or else sell them to another installation that is short of allowances. So trading brings flexibility that ensures emissions are cut um, where um, it costs least to do so. And also a robust carbon price promotes um, investment in innovative and low carbon technologies. But the EU also allocates free allowances beyond uh, the power generating sector, especially in those sectors where there is a fear of carbon leakage. So for instance, there are still quite a lot of free allowances allocated in the manufacturing industry, as well as the airline industry. And it's estimated that almost half um, of all allowances are allocated for free, which um, might be an issue when implementing the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So I now want to talk about the consequences this might have for uh, compatibility with WTO law. So just as a brief reminder, the World Trade Organization is a, a multilateral international organization um, in Geneva that has 164 members at present, so a vast majority of countries around the world are members of the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization um, maintains rules on the trading goods, services and intellectual property rights. Um, so those countries that are uh, party to the World Trade Organization have to abide by the rules of the WTO. Um, and um, until recently, because now uh, the Apple body um, dispute settlement system is in an impasse, um, the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO was um, highly, a highly successful feature of the system um, because it is a mandatory state-to-state uh, -state dispute settlement for WTO members, first of all, um, and second of all, because um, of its technical nature, um, and the fact that it is um, exclusive dispute settlement mechanism, so it would prevent parties from going elsewhere. Um, this was seen as a highly um, successful um, feature of the system. More than 600 disputes have been settled um, by the WTO um, since its establishment in 1995. As I already alluded to a little bit before, um, the appellate body uh, of the World Trade Organization is currently at an impasse due to um, disagreement on the appointment of new um, appellate body members, especially based on uh, criticism uh, on the functioning of the system by the United States. Nevertheless, um, the WTO has a lot to say about cross-border trade, and since the CBAM affects cross-border trade, it also automatically um, is relevant for WTO rules. 
So, um, with regard to liberalizing trade, the WTO um, has rules on um, preventing um, discrimination and reducing trade barriers, the barriers to trade, mainly for its members. One of the most basic rules of the WTO is what is called the most favored nation uh, rule, which basically means that um, any advantage, favor, privilege, or immunity granted by any contracting party to any product originating in or destined for any other country shall be accorded immediately and unconditionally to the like product originating in or destined in the territories of all other contracting parties. Now, you can imagine that if certain countries um, fall under the um, CBAM, the European uh, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, with regard to the imports of their products, and others don't, um, this might already be problematic. So, for instance, if you think of um, developing countries that might be exempted, but also customs unions countries um, that do fall within that because the EU is a customs union, um, nevertheless, there might be differences uh, with regard to the treatment of um, uh, products from different countries. This might be problematic. Also, because you have to look at the like product. So, if you um, treat uh, steel and aluminum from um, one country that doesn't have a similar emissions trading system in place, such as the EU, as you do from another country that does have such a uh, uh, system in place, this might run afoul of Article 1. Why? Well, if you look at the like product guidelines that exist on WTO, um, within the WTO framework, to determine whether two products are alike, we generally look at the characteristics of the product, um, we look at the end use of the product, then also how the product is classified under the Harmonized System Convention and the schedule of concessions of EU member states. And we also consider consumer tastes and habits, so whether the product is attracting the same consumers. Now you can imagine that um, if we think of how a product is produced, so so-called process and production methods, um, and for instance, what type of um, energy or what type of uh, carbon footprint um, is used to produce a particular product, this is nowhere concretely reflected in these guidelines or these criteria. And therefore, you could say that to treat a product that looks the same and would meet all these requirements, but just different, uh, is different with regard to the carbon content or the way it was produced, might be pro problematic um, to fall within the scope uh, of this article. And these two products would likely qualify as like products. So again, if a country that um, imports these products um, is treated differently based on, let's say, the emission trading scheme that it has in place than a country that doesn't have that, um, this might be a problem with regard to most favored nation treatment. I also want to highlight that some of the articles I discuss here with regard to WTO law are just uh, a partial a snapshot of all the articles that might be relevant uh, with regard to the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, there's also elements of subsidies, whether for instance um, such a mechanism could be considered a subsidy if it um, supports um, EU producers and their exports. Um, this all depends on the final um, design and the final application of the carbon border adjustment mechanism um, and will only time will tell. So here I'm only highlighting a couple of articles that um, are relevant and that might be problematic, but all in the end depends on the measure that the EU has in place and how that measure is designed. So although the EU's goal is to ensure that the CBAM is um, designed in, the, in a World Trade Organization compatible manner, uh, there are definitely articles where um, 
this is still quite questionable or unclear and will be, have to be shown in practice. So apart from Article 1 that we just covered, most resignation treatment, another article that is relevant in this respect is Article 2 of the GATT, which refers to the schedule of concessions. So within the WTO framework, you are allowed to discriminate, but only allowed to discriminate within a transparent, or in a transparent manner, which means that you have to um, agree your tariffs, your import tariffs on goods, and um, the schedule of concession that every WTO member has um, becomes an integral part of the agreement. And you are not allowed to um, lever, levy higher duties, import duties, on the products that are in the schedule of concessions. Now, as it seems now, the carbon border adjustment mechanism is designed as an internal tax, so a tax upon importation. Um, if it functions like that, and that internal tax applies equally to products within the EU, that could be um, uh, compatible with the WTO. If, however, it proves to be solely um, a um, basically an import duty disguised as a tax, this might be more problematic. The same applies to national treatment. So it is very important that um, for the EU to be successful in implementing uh, the CBAM, it also has to abide by uh, rules on national treatment. And um, national treatment is taken up in Article 3 of the GATT, um, and it basically states that um, imported products should be treated no less favorably uh, than like products, than like national products. If we talk about a likeness, I already discussed that in the framework of Article 1 of the GATT. It again begs the question when two products are alike. Um, but it basically means that the EU has to ensure that um, imported aluminum, steel, cement, um, electricity is treated no less favorably than um, aluminum, steel, and electricity produced in the EU. Now, this might be problematic with regard to free allowances, because as I mentioned before, the EU also um, allocates free allowances to particular industries. And potentially this might be a problem with regard to discriminating against um, imports of these um, industries from abroad. Um, so these are some of the issues that might be a problem with regard to WTO compatibility. Connected issues in this respect are also um, other um, tensions within the framework of the World Trade Organization, such as the divide between developed and developing countries. Um, it might be harder for developing countries um, to meet the standards um, as set out in CBAM because they might have a lack of emission trading systems um, in place or um, because it's just higher to meet, more difficult to meet higher environmental standards. And so in practice, the result might be that developing countries are more often subject um, to CBAM um, uh, costs rather than, let's say, developed countries that have cleaner mechanisms. Um, the, the, the question then is, is really how permissible is it within the WTO context to exempt poorer countries from uh, the carbon border adjustment arrangement? It would seem reasonable, but also again, this has to be carefully designed. Um, and last but not least, within the framework of the WTO, it's sometimes very hard to draw the line between um, real environmental objectives, so advancing real environmental objectives, and by protectionism. So when you're an importer that wants to import into the EU, it will be very difficult for you to determine whether the EU policy in place is only there to protect the environment, which seems likely as it also will apply or applies the same to its national industries, but also to determine whether there are some protectionist elements. And often the two go hand in hand. So it's some, almost impossible to always clearly distinguish the two. Um, 
So yeah, indeed, there might also be this class protectionism uh, here, and um, only time will tell. It's important to note, uh, to note that the mandatory dispute settlement mechanism in the WTO it works on a case-by-case -case basis, and on um, a case has to be initiated uh, for it to start a dispute. So there's no prosecutor within the WTO system that goes and monitors whether countries uh, apply and abide by WTO rules and um, on the basis of that starts a dispute against a country? No. It has to be a country whose industry has been injured that starts a dispute against another WTO member. So if there is no dispute, there is no uh, presumption of a problem. So time will tell whether this concerns environmentalism or protectionism and whether uh, disputes will be triggered. Now, if there is a violation of the GATT, so there is another WTO member that um, is under the assumption that its um, uh, rights under the World Trade Organization have been violated by the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, um, and that this violates the general agreement on tariffs and trade, the EU will have to try and justify this in a dispute um, if it wants to uphold the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism by invoking the exceptions in Article 20. So countries are allowed to um, have policies in place that deviate from WTO rules, but under strict conditions. So the chapeau of Article 20 says, subject to the requirement that su such measures are not applied in a manner which would constitute a means of arbitrary or unjustifiable discrimination between countries where the same conditions prevail, or a disguised restriction on international trade, Nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent the adoption or enforcement by any contracting party of measures, and I only have a selection of subparagraphs here that are relevant in this case, which would be B, necessary to protect human, animal, plant life, or health, or G, relating to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources, if such measures are made effective in conjunction with restrictions on domestic production or consumption. Now, I should mention that um, in the past, in past disputes, it has been very hard for uh, WTO members to successfully invoke the WTO um, GATT Article 20 exception uh, with regard to a measure, often because it was decided that while the measure met one of these subparagraphs, it didn't meet the requirements of the chapeau. So it was either a disguised restriction on trade or discriminatory in the end. Here, the EU could invoke these two subparagraphs because it could argue that the CBAM is really, on the long run, necessary to prote protect human, animal, plant life, or health, or that it, is re that it relates to the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. Now, in recent years, the subparagraph of Article G has been much easier to meet. Why? Um, because, first of all, uh, relating to is an easier threshold to meet than necessary. And because the definition of exhaustible natural resources um, by previous um, panels and appellate body has been interpreted in a very broad manner, also to include, for instance, clean air as an exhaustible natural resource. So um, the EU could argue that CO2 emissions are um, relating to conserving the exhaustible natural resource of clean air. But uh, again, we will uh, see this only when a dispute is triggered in the system. I personally wouldn't be surprised to see a dispute triggered uh, once this mechanism is introduced, um, just because there are so many aspects to it um, and it affects um, really um, primary inputs and secondary inputs. Um, so it has a very wide reach um, and it really will affect a lot of um, important industries, also with regard to the way it will be administered. That being said, um, at this stage, 
quite a lot of things about the mechanism are still unclear. So it really still depends on the final uh, design uh, of the mechanism. And only then one could um, see how WTO law how could be potentially um, violated um, with regard to importing in this case. So finally, I brief, briefly want to discuss potential uh, consequences of the carbon border adjustment mechanism for the United States. So just a fun fact, the EU Green Deal got its name from the US New Deal, um, which President Roosevelt um, conceptualized in 1932. And it kind of has some similarities in the sense that, as I said at the beginning, the EU Green Deal only has 24 pages and it's very broad. The goal is clear. We want to go towards a decarbonized um, Europe by 2050. But the time frame is really long and therefore you do not want to be bogged down in technicalities and strict requirements and details and you do need flexibility. I want to just briefly contrast this also to the 2019 Green New Deal that was proposed by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Edward Markey, which also combines Roosevelt economic approach with renewable energy and resource efficiency and the whole idea of making the U.S. carbon neutral. Um, but unfortunately, um, that didn't make it. Nevertheless, there's quite a lot of parallels also with the Biden plan for a clean energy revolution and environmental justice um, with the Green New Deal, so the US version of the Green New Deal. Um, in essence, I would say that at present, the EU strategy seems to be more evolved, although still vague. The concreteness will come with the EU climate law and, um, and the establishment of this carbon border adjustment mechanism. That doesn't mean that the US doesn't have its own plans on how to make the global economy greener. And um, it's interesting here to look at some of the strategies by, uh, set forward by new US trade representative Catherine Tai. So basically, the U.S. action plan with regard to contributing to a greener global economy is to revive negotiations on the Envi Environmental Goods Agreement. This is an agreement um, that is um, being negotiated within the framework of the World Trade Organization to reduce tariffs on so-called environmental goods. The whole challenge with this agreement is to agree on a list on environmental goods and to decide what environmental goods are. Our, our bikes, for instance, environmental goods. You could argue that they're environmental goods, but then where does the list end? Yeah. So this is one of the, the issues where the environmental goods agreement got stuck. And one of the plans of um, the, the new USTR is to revive um, these negotiations. Um, what also is on plan is really to negotiate uh, trade obligations that protect forests and oceans, so you can, you can think about fishery subsidies negotiations, um, and that I think are parts where big progress can be made. Another quite controversial but um, hopefully progressive um, idea is to revise WTO subsidy rules to encourage investment in clean energy infrastructure and also innovate research development um, in renewable energy resources. However, <laughs> the US has also said that, uh, USTR has also said that it really wants to exercise restraint on the introduction of a carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism itself. So it is unlikely that the US will um, have a similar mechanism in place anytime soon. Now, Last but not least, I very briefly want to touch upon potential consequences for U.S. industries. And basically, if the EU institutes this carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, it's right now likely only to cover a few carbon intensive products like steel and cement and not immediately threatening, threatening to U.S. imports. But 
There are definitely loud complaints from China, India, and others that do import these products into the EU. However, if you extend the CBAM to manufacturers, it will be more problematic, and that can provoke more transatlantic frictions, because then you will really look at the inputs and the way in which um, products were processed or produced and processed, and that's where you really uh, venture into um, the yeah tricky area. So I hope this kind of gave you some insights about what the actual deal is with the EU Green Deal with regard to the strategy, the key uh, forms of legislation, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that basically wants to extend the European emission trading system to imports of particular products from abroad, um, how that might be problematic with regard to uh, the laws of the World Trade Organization, and last but not not least, whether the U.S. plans to have such a mechanism in place and how such a carbon border um, adjustment mechanism might affect um, U.S. industries. I want to really thank you for, for your attention. I wish you a healthy and green summer, and I really hope that we have the chance to meet each other again um, in person in Vermont um, when it's possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that great talk, Dr. Marhold. So for our listeners, we have a few minutes to ask some questions. Um, as a reminder, for those of you who are watching on the live stream through the VLS website, you can click on the icon at the bottom of the video, which will bring up the chat box where you can add your question. And if you're watching on Facebook, on the Facebook live stream, add your question to the comment box below. And we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, a few questions to start things off, Dr. Marhold. Um, could you speak a little bit about the distribution of greenhouse gas emissions across sectors in the European Union, and in particular, how transportation emissions are um, factored into the um, the, the New Deal. Yeah, of course. So thank you for your question. So um, the EU tries to, in the framework of the EU Green Deal, but also in connection with its nationally determined contributions in the framework of the Paris Agreement, uh, really uh, divide its um, allocation between, uh, or its carbon uh, emission uh, reduction targets between ETS covered industries and, and non ETS covered industries. Um, so the ETS covered industries would be those industries um, that are uh, carbon intensive and really the main energy industries. Um, and the non ETS industries um, also cover um, those sectors, such as, in fact, uh, might be debatable, but let's say waste management and also transportation, etc. So they are not necessarily, uh, they don't fall under the ETS. Um, but they are kind of uh, calculated towards, for instance, the nationally determined contributions that the EU has um, uh, submitted as part of the um, wider Paris Agreement climate goals. Now, another interesting feature is that with regard to these nationally determined contributions, you see that um, there is really now one uh, big EU goal, EU-wide goal with regard to emission reductions, um, where the EU tries to, per country, decide um, what each EU member state can do uh, with respect to ETS covered and non-ETS covered um, emission uh, reductions, um, and to submit that whole goal as one uh, target, basically. Another thing that um, had to be kind of recalculated in this respect is that the UK is no longer part uh, of this. Um, and so the UK, which is actually responsible for a large part of emission reductions, um, their um, part of, of the share had to be absorbed by separate EU member states. So there's a regulation in place, and there you can really quite in detail see um, what, cover, what sectors and what countries are covered um, and how that, uh, yeah, how that is basically allocated for, for EU member states. 
are products that are um, being imported from a greater distance and therefore have more uh, greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, are those um, treated and are they disfavored um, under the trade mechanisms that you described um, at the, the cross border? Not necessarily so. So, so far this is unclear and uh, that remains quite vague. Um, there is a calculation mechanism on how um, uh, the CBAM allowances are calculated, so how energy intensive a product is. Um, but it's unclear and still quite vague to what extent, for instance, transportation um, of something from very far away is also allocated in that. But you could say that um, it can be, since it both covers um, primary, um, like primary energy production, but also what goes into um, manufacturing a particular product. So um, it seems that the EU really wants to look at the whole picture holistically and take that into account. Now, um, the issue is, of course, that products that are more often from further away will often be also from developing countries that have then more trouble in meeting those standards and will be disadvantaged in this sense. That's been a big issue in the United States, um, for instance, with the clean fuel standard in California and um, the desire to do um, kind of full life cycle greenhouse gas emissions accounting, including um, you know, land use, you're transitioning forests to farmland to grow corn for ethanol, for instance, um, and then whether places like Brazil that produce a lot of ethanol would would be at a disadvantage as compared to um, American companies producing ethanol because there'd be less transportation. Um, so that's something there's been a lot of litigation about in the US with the, um, the Commerce Clause. And so it's interesting to think about how that might play out differently in an international setting like Europe where uh, you, know, you don't have the same domestic commerce issues, but you have a whole other set of um, trade issues in terms of not wanting to discriminate, so to speak, against uh, particular sources just based on location. Yeah, I think the whole um, issue with the carbon border adjustment mechanism is that really the goal of the EU is to make it WTO compatible. But since it has so many features and it really so much depends on the um, definite form that we'll have, it's very likely that we will only know later when particular industries in, let's say, developing countries are affected um, and will lobby their governments to start a dispute at the WTO on the WTO level. Um, and therefore, that only kind of remains to be seen. And this is also one of the criticisms so far of the mechanism in the sense that it really leaves a lot of things open. Um, and I am actually very curious because the final draft uh, or the final uh, version is, is supposed to be released, uh, released mid-July. And only then we will really know um, what is possible and what is not possible. But that still doesn't show us the effects in practice, which might be extremely far reaching if you think of um, all the industries that are covered and also, also the process and production methods that are covered by that. Well, maybe next year's Hot Topics, we can compare notes between how far the EU has made it and how far uh, we've made it here with the Green New Deal or Biden's climate plan. They all seem like they're sort of equally at the starting gate right now. So hopefully we'll have a lot more to talk about next summer. So that seems like a good place to end, although I'm sure we could talk about this for a lot longer. Thank you so much, Dr. Marhold, for that really interesting talk. Um, and thank you to everybody who tuned in today. Our next Hot Topics lecture will be right here on July 1st at noon this Thursday, and we hope you can join us then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.